A Lined by Writing By Charles Dickens Audiobook 26x73 And, only five days before leaving London for his second year abroad, abroad, he wrote at great length, and in remarkable detail, to Burdett Coutts about a project to be realised, if she agreed, on his return to London for her financing the setting up of an asylum for homeless women, including those just released from prison but with nowhere to go to. Operating on a Marx system pioneered by Captain Makenchi Edwin Governor of Norfolk Island and much admired by Dickens, it would function as a rehabilitation centre, training such women in order, punctuality, cleanliness, the whole routine of household duties. As washing, mending, cooking before sending them to British colonies overseas as potential wives and mothers. The normal ragged Charles Dickens school did not become a reality but the asylum certainly did and was to become a major commitment for Dickens for over a decade. Point 20 Dickens's decision to move his household abroad again for a year was made at the end of January though he did not settle definitely for Switzerland until April, Catherine, he disloyally told Madame de la Rue, had positively refused to contemplate a return to Genoa. He wanted partly to mark publicly his disengagement from the daily news and, as he later put it to Forster, to fill up the pit in my literary life, made by that unhappy paper, and partly to give himself some respite from the pressures he was always under in London in order to concentrate on the new book. These pressures included the endless flood of begging letters, for example, or requests to speak at charity dinners, as he had done, very effectively, on April 6 for the newly formed General Theatrical Fund. Financial considerations were also important. It would be cheaper for the family to live abroad and, as Chuzzlewit had not been the money spinner he had hoped for, Dickens's finances were still rather shaky. The reissue of Oliver Twist in ten monthly parts, January Oct, with a new cover design by Cruikshank made no profit for him. Bradbury and Evans's delay in paying his daily news salary into his account meant that he found himself, to his great distress, to be overdrawn on March 5. His concern about keeping his name as a law student on the books at the Middle Temple, see above, p. 139, so that he might one day be called to the bar where there are many little pickings to be got is another indication of ongoing financial anxiety like his inquiring about the possibility of his being appointed to the paid magistracy of London. Not that, to outward appearance, he seemed to be in the least weighed down by his financial worries. Lord Geoffrey described him at this time as looking radiant with happiness and health and looking like an airy cornet just vaulted out of a cavalry saddle. Point 21 Dickens decided on moving his household to Switzerland because the country had impressed him so favorably when he was traveling through it the previous year, and by May 19, the day after Pictures was published, he had arranged to let Devonshire Terrace to an MP. For £300 per half year. He mentions his intention of getting up some mountain knowledge for fictional purposes but it was to be more than four years before he set a scene in Switzerland, Chapter 58 of Copperfield, and, even then, the description is somewhat perfunctory. Meanwhile, he was keen to bring his wider circle of friends up to date with his plans. By that I mean, of course, his devoted readers many of whom he must have somewhat disconcerted by becoming editor of a daily paper. His preface to pictures provided an ideal opportunity to reassure them. Headed the reader's passport, it serves several purposes, in fact. Readers are warned not to expect a lot of conventional, guidebook information about Italy's antiquities and art treasures, or disquisitions on the country's political situation. Also, Dickens deftly invokes Barnaby Rudge to defend himself against potential accusations of anti-Catholicism. His readers, he writes, should regard daily nooses and the noose itself, 1,846 pictures as a series of faint reflections. Mere shadows in the water. Of places to which the imaginations of most people are attracted in a greater or less degree, on which mine had dwelt for years. 
The Athenaeum wittily commented, welcoming the book in its columns on May 23rd, the substance of the small volume is not so much Italy visited by Mr. Dickens as Mr. Dickens visited by Italy. This preface to pictures, like all Dickens's prefaces, is essentially an open letter to his readers, so dear to him in all his visions, but it is unique in that it contains something approaching an apology. He refers to the daily news interlude as a brief mistake I made, not long ago, in disturbing the old relations between myself and my readers, and departing for a moment from my old pursuits. But, the apology made, he can now reassure them that he is about to resume those pursuits, joyfully, in Switzerland, where I can at once work out the themes I have now in my mind, without interruption. And while I keep my English audience within speaking distance, extend my knowledge of a noble country, inexpressibly attractive to me. Point 22 Chapter 11 Dombey and Other Dealings 1846 to 1848 Dealings with the firm of Dombey and Son Wholesale, Retail, and for Exportation Full title of the monthly part issue of Dombey and Son Although literature as a profession has no distinct status in England, I am bound to say that what I experience of its recognition, all through society, in my own person is honorable, ample, and independent. Dickens to D. M. Moyer, June 17, 1848 T. T. He Dickens Household, with Roche the brave courier again in attendance, left London on May 31, 1846 and reached Lausanne nine days later. It was here in this attractive, steep-hilled little town that Dickens decided to settle, notwithstanding his fear that, once he was at work again, he might sorely miss the populous streets of London for his customary night walks. He rented a villa called Rosemont, a kind of beautiful bandbox, with pleasant grounds sloping down to the lake and a fine view of mountains on the opposite shore. He rearranged the furniture throughout the whole house before preparing his first floor study, which was something larger than a plate warmer, for the work he was now so eager to begin. He was enraptured by the scenery and charmed by the Swiss. They were a good wholesome people to live near Jesuit-ridden kings on the brighter side of the mountains and he rejoiced in the overthrow, with minimal force, on October 7 of Geneva's reactionary government by a group of radicals. Writing to McCready on the 24th he described the revolutionaries as free spirits, nobly generous and moderate, even in the first transports of victory. Elevated by a splendid popular education. And bent on freedom from all tyrants, whether their crowns be golden or shaven. Point one he found himself and his family welcomed into a congenial little society of Anglo Swiss led by William Haldimand, a retired banker and former MP. A philanthropist after Dickens's heart, Haldimand was co founder of a local asylum for the blind, and Dickens would always remember him fondly as one of Dombey and other dealings. 1846 to 1848 to view this image, please refer to the print version of this book. 25 Rosemont Villa, Lausanne The noblest hearted gentleman in the world. Two other wealthy philanthropists were also of the circle, William and Maria de Surgat, and another former MP, the Hon. Richard Watson of Rockingham Castle in Northamptonshire, and his wife Lavinia. Until de Surgat died in 1869 Dickens wrote to him annually, long and interesting letters sending personal news but commenting also, often in some detail, on national and world affairs. These letters were, doubtless, a continuation of the kind of conversations he, the de Surgats and the Watsons had enjoyed during this time in Lausanne with the always stimulatingly argumentative Haldimand. As to the Watsons, they quickly became two of Dickens's very dearest friends, especially Lavinia, who was a woman of great charm, intelligence, and strong artistic interests. Point two Watson's diary records an agreeable round of dinners, whist, outdoor games, and exploring expeditions, including one to the spectacular Great St. Bernard Pass, memorably described by Dickens in a letter to Forster. This place always had a weird fascination for him his eldest son recalled. 
It features vividly in an article lying awake written five years later and again in the opening of Book Two of Little Dorrit in 1856. For Watson Dickens was the most natural unaffected distinguished man I ever met and he comments more than once on what fun he was to be with and on the wonderful charm and spirit of his readings aloud of his own work. Dickens gave three such private readings in Lausanne, one of Charles Dickens each of the first two numbers of his new story, Dombey and Son, and one of his new Christmas book, The Battle of Life. His friend's responsive enthusiasm led Dickens to write, semi-seriously, to Forster about how in these days of lecturings and readings, a great deal of money might possibly be made, if it were not in for dig, by one's having readings of one's own books. Forster made light of this but secretly feared, with good reason, as things turned out, that this would not be the last he would hear of it. Point three. These readings from his current work show that, as we might expect, Dickens was not spending all his time socializing and sightseeing. His first task at Rosemont had been to clear the decks for work on his new novel. This involved writing a long letter to Lord John Russell about the ragged schools and another to Burdett Coutts about her projected home for homeless women. He had also to finish his children's New Testament, a redaction of the Gospels written in appropriately plain and simple language with, of course, none of the bravura touches to be found in his later child's history of England. Dickens's depiction of Jesus as primarily a great teacher and healer is in continuity with his social journalism and with religious references in his fiction. Thus he exhorts his children never to be proud or unkind to any of the poor. If they are bad, think that they would have been better, if they had had kind friends, and good homes, and been better taught. Nearly two years later, in the final number of Dombey, he would sum up for adult readers his interpretation of the New Testament in his description of it as the blessed history, in which the blind, lame, palsied beggar, the criminal, the woman stained with shame, the shunt of all our dainty clay, has each a portion, that no human pride, indifference, or sophistry. Can take away point four he had been at Rosemont a few days before his big box arrived. This contained his preferred writing materials and what Forster calls certain quaint little bronze figures that he always liked to have on his writing desk, including a pair of dueling frogs and a dog thief slash salesman with lots of little dogs in his pockets and under his arms. By June 28 everything was in order and he could send Forster the awaited message began Dombey after making what he called a plunge over head and ears into this story, the writing of which was to dominate the next twenty months of his life, first in Switzerland, then in Paris, and lastly in London and Broadstairs. He seems to have arrived at the title without any of the hesitation seen in the case of Chuzzlewit or of Dombey's immediate successors, and was anxious that it should be kept profoundly secret until publication day no doubt because of its surprise departure from his traditional life and adventures formula and its revelation that he was venturing into a new sphere of human activity. Its original version, used as an epigraph to this chapter, puts the emphasis on the family firm, which perhaps Dickens might first have thought would figure more prominently in the story than it ultimately does. When the novel appeared in volume form, however, the title became simply Dombey and Son, thus putting the emphasis squarely Dombey and other dealings. 1846-1848 On the Family Both versions of the title conceal an irony not revealed to readers until five months into the story when they would discover that Dombey and Son was to be a daughter after all. 5. The plot of Dombey was planned out in much greater detail previous to the actual writing than had been the case with any of its predecessors, with the possible exception of Barnaby Rudge. On 25 or July 26 Dickens sent Forster the first four chapters of the new novel together with a general outline of the plot which Forster reproduces, with some omissions, in his life. The outline describes Dombey's pride in his son and his indifference towards his daughter which will turn to positive hatred after the boy's early death. But this rejected daughter will come out better than any son at last when the firm crashes and Dombey becomes a broken man. 
eventually, he will come remorsefully to understand that his daughter has been his unknown good genius always and so end the struggle with himself. Hardly any other characters are mentioned, apart from two or three who appear in chapters 1 to 4. There is no hint of Dombey's disastrous second marriage, which, together with Carker's villainy, also unmentioned in the synopsis as we have it, precipitates the novel's catastrophe. But, as Dickens tells Forster, he is here giving him only what cooks call the stock of the soup and all kinds of things will be added to it. It already represents, however, a remarkable advance in depth of conception and detailed planning when compared with the overarching melodramatic device mentioned in Dickens's notes for Chuzzlewit 4, Old Martin's plot to degrade and punish Pecksniff in the end. The novel was to be illustrated by Brown, as all the previous monthly number novels had been, and Dickens must have sent him an outline similar to that sent to Forster in order to facilitate the designing of a cover for the monthly parts shadowing out the story's drift and bearing. Dickens was very anxious Brown should avoid caricature in depicting the protagonist of the new, more character-driven, kind of story he was attempting and wanted the artist to view a certain city magnate whose appearance he had had in mind when describing Mr. Dombey. Brown was unable to do this but sent Dickens a sheet of 29 sketches of potential Dombies for him to choose from. Stimulated perhaps by the new developments in Dickens's art, Brown showed considerable enterprise in his own contribution to Dombey and Dickens was pleased with his work, with one notable exception to be mentioned below, his depiction of M.R.S. Pipchin. Their collaboration was of course greatly facilitated once Dickens was back in London and communication by word of mouth or brief, rapid notes could be resumed. This applied also to Forster's contribution. Proof correcting, suggesting cuts and changes, and acting as a general sounding board for Dickens's ideas. Writing from Lausanne, Dickens asked for his response to the notion that young Walter Gay might be made a more pathetic version of Hogarth's idle apprentice, gradually and naturally trailing away, from that love of adventure and boyish light-heartedness, into negligence, idleness, dissipation, Charles Dickens to view this image, please refer to the print version of this book. 26 Some of Brown's trial sketches for Mr. Dombey submitted to Dickens and reproduced by Forster in his life of Dickens' dishonesty and ruin. Do you think it may be done, he asked, without making people angry. Forster evidently thought not and Dickens ultimately acquiesced despite all the literary advantages he perceived in it. Point six Dombey is the first Dickens novel for which there exists a complete set of preparatory notes for each monthly number. An isolated set, quoted above, exists for Chuzzlewit 4, a working practice Dickens followed for all his subsequent novels in this format, as well as for Hard Times which was published as a weekly serial but planned in five monthly numbers. For each number he prepared a sheet of paper approximately 7 times 9 inches by turning it sideways, with Dombey and other dealings. 1846 to 1848 The long side horizontal, dividing it in two, and then using the left-hand side for what he called mems. These were memoranda to himself about events and scenes that might feature in the number, directions as to the pace of the narrative, particular phrases he wanted to work in, questions to himself about whether such and such a character should appear in this number or be kept waiting in the wings, usually with some such answer as yes, no or not yet added later, in short, what has been succinctly described as brief aids in decision-making, planning and remembering. Among the general mems for No. 3, for example, we find that wonderful image for little Paul's desolation at M.R.S. Pipchin's, as if he had taken life. Sick unfurnished, and the upholster were never coming while the Major, Carker and the offices in the city are all marked to stand over. In the notes for later numbers we find such mems as Uncle Soul to Die, answered by No. Run away to look after Walter, DS7, carry on the servants as a sort of odd chorus to the story, DSX, and be patient with Carker. Get him on very slowly, without incident, DS12. 
In DS7 MRS Skewton and Edith make their debut and are the subject of an elaborate MEM. The Mother and Daughter The Mother, and her cant about heart, and nature daughter who has been put through her paces, before countless marrying men, like a horse for sale. Proud and disgust weary of her degradation, but going on, for it's too late now, to try to turn back. These to be encountered at Lemington Point 7 on the right-hand side of the sheet Dickens would generally write the numbers and titles of the three chapters that make up each monthly part and jot down, either before or after writing them, the names of the main characters and events featuring in each chapter, with occasionally a crucial fragment of the dialogue like Little Paul's Papa What's Money, in Chapter 8, or a note of significant events like Death's Warning to M.R.S. Skewton in Chapter 36. In the notes for the climactic chapter 47, The Thunderbolt, which contains the highly sensational scene of the discovery of the scandalous flight of the second MRS Dombey, we find the following. Opening Reflexio Matter Sanitary In the chapter as written the narrator pauses near the beginning to reflect upon nature and nurture and upon the millions of immortal creatures whose moral nature is warped by having to live in foul conditions. This chapter was, Dickens notes, originally intended to close the number but was then transposed with chapter 48 in which Florence finds refuge with Captain Cuddle in the little wooden midshipman, so as to leave a pleasanter impression on the reader. Particularly interesting as showing Dickens's continual experimentation as a writer is a note for chapter 14, Paul grows more and more old-fashioned and goes home for the holidays. It reads, his illness only expressed in the child's own feelings. Not otherwise described. Dickens told Charles Dickens Forster he found the episode difficult to write in this way but it was a new way of doing it. And likely to be pretty. Certainly this technique greatly enhances the effectiveness of Dom B.V., March 1847, the number that ends with Paul's death, and famously caused Thackeray, whose Vanity Fair had just begun appearing in monthly numbers, to bang this number of Dombey down on the table in Bradbury and Evans's printing office and exclaim, there's no writing against such power as this. One has no chance. Read that chapter describing young Paul's death. It is unsurpassed. It is stupendous. Eight alongside his new system of making detailed notes and memoranda for each number two important developments in Dickens's novelistic art manifest themselves in Dombey, one concerning technique and the other content. The first involves a more detailed and patterned use of emblems than heretofore. Some part of the natural world, or some human institution important for the plot is depicted as imaging or emblematizing some spiritual, moral, or political reality. Thus the sea in Dombey is both that mighty mass of water across which the firm of Dombey and Son sends its trading vessels, including the ill-named, ill-fated son and heir, emblem of little Paul, to gather riches for itself, but it is also an image of that dark and unknown sea that rolls round all the world out upon which the Dombey children's dying mother drifts at the beginning of the book. The reader is carefully reminded of this aspect of the sea at various crucial points in the narrative and Dickens's final note for his final chapter reads end with the sea. Carrying through, what the waves were always saying, and the invisible country far away. Looking ahead to such later triumphs of this emblematizing art as the depiction of the London fog and the court of chancery in Bleak House, the prison and the circumlocution office in Little Dorrit and the river and the dust heaps of our mutual friend, we recognize in them successors to this presentation of the sea in Dombey.9 The second development in Dickens's art marked by Dombey is that this novel featuring a rejected daughter and a bartered bride inaugurates a ten-year period in his writing career during which all his novels, with the exception of Copperfield, have female rather than male protagonists. They also explore and here we may certainly include Copperfield, a number of more complex female characters, new in Dickens's fiction, like Rosa Dartle in Copperfield, Louisa Gradgrind in Hard Times, and Miss Wade in Little Dorrit. 
At the same time many of the central concerns of these books relate closely to the difficulties, social restrictions, humiliations, and consequent resentment experienced by women from widely different backgrounds in the male-oriented world of Victorian England. Point ten for the first eight months of the writing of Dombey Dickens continued living abroad, first in Lausanne and then in Paris, returning to London just before the publication of Dombey VI. He wrote frequently to Forster and, since Forster draws lavishly on these letters in his life, we know a great deal about the stresses Dombey and other dealings. 1846-1848 and strains of composing this particular novel you can hardly imagine Dickens wrote on August 30th, what infinite pains I take, or what extraordinary difficulty I find in getting on fast. This was partly, he continued, because he was now putting a deliberate curb on himself. I seem to have such a preposterous sense of the ridiculous, after this long rest. As to be constantly requiring to restrain myself from launching into extravagances in the height of my enjoyment. He suffered, too, from the absence of crowded streets. For a week or a fortnight I can write prodigiously in a retired place, as at Broadstairs, and a day in London sets me up again and starts me. But the toil and labor of writing, day after day, without that magic lantern is immense. My figures seem disposed to stagnate without crowds about them. Twice during his sojourn in Lausanne he had to gather up Catherine and Georgina and dash over to Geneva for a week or so for the sake of the streets, afterwards finding himself greatly better both in himself and as a writer. Another problem was that he took a little while to get his hand in again as regards writing the right amount to fit the 32 printed pages of each number. The first four numbers were all overwritten and needed cutting in proof. Point 11 superimposed upon these difficulties was another, hitherto unprecedented, one that proved formidable indeed. He had agreed with Bradbury and Evans to write a Christmas book for 1846. Such keenly anticipated annual productions from his pen were guaranteed money spinners, and now found himself having to begin this book when he had just got started on Dombey. It was, he told Mitten on 25 September, desperate work. He had in earlier days managed to write two stories simultaneously but the first one had always been well underway before he had begun the second. Now. Not only did he have to begin both books at the same time but the situation was aggravated in that his idea for this particular Christmas offering, to be called the Battle of Life. A love story, was more like the leading idea for another novel than for any Christmas ghost story or fairy tale and it is, indeed, the only one of the Christmas books to be devoid of any supernatural element, Dickens wanting, as he told Forster, to make it a simple domestic tale. The setting is the site of a long-ago great battle in which thousands upon thousands had been killed and he wanted to contrast such carnage with the nobler moral and emotional battles fought out every day in the hearts and minds of ordinary men and women. His somewhat bizarre illustration of this deals with two devoted sisters. The younger one, Marion, sacrifices her own love for her reciprocally loving suitor because she realizes that her sister Grace selflessly loves him too and believes rightly as it turns out, that he will transfer his affections to Grace if she removes herself for some years. This story must have had an intense personal resonance for Dickens, relating in some convoluted way to his memories of Mary Hogarth and his current relationships with Catherine and Georgina. No doubt this contributed to his intense frustration over the narrow limits within which he Charles Dickens had to work. What an affecting story I could have made of it in one octavo volume, he lamented to Forster. He would, we may be sure, have been especially gratified by the Daily News's reviewer's comparison of the battle to the Vicar of Wakefield on December 26 since this favorite novel, its length would have been ideal for the battle, he thought, was running in his head as he toiled at his atypical Christmas book. It was at his suggestion that the characters were depicted in the coats and gowns of dear old Goldsmith's Day. Point 12 As Dickens agonized over writing this little book, constantly haunted by the idea that I am wasting the marrow of the larger book and ought to be at rest, 
his spirits sank so low that, he told Forster later, he felt himself to be in serious danger, and he came close to abandoning the battle altogether. With characteristic bravado, he added that, despite everything, he nevertheless walked my fifteen miles a day constantly, at a great pace. Meanwhile, the first number of Dombey appeared, 30 September. It had been eagerly awaited and well advertised so that it sold like the hottest of cakes. To Dickens's great joy, it outstripped the sale of the first number of Chuzzlewit by more than 12,000. Succeeding numbers more than maintained what he described to Beard as this prodigious success, with the reading public in general endorsing the judgment of the reviewer in Chambers's Edinburgh Journal who declared on October 24 that the good ship Boz was now righted and once more fairly afloat. Point 13 buoyed up by this triumph, Dickens managed, after further struggles, to finish the battle and sent the last section to Forster on October 18. Maclis, Leach, Stanfield and the young punch artist Richard Doyle were supplying the all-important illustrations and Forster was double-checking the proofs with special instructions to be on the watch for lapses into blank verse. I cannot help it, when I am very much in earnest, Dickens told him, and asked him to knock out a word's brains here and there if necessary. Dickens revisited Geneva from 19 to October 28 in order to concentrate on the writing of Dombey III. In this number Paul, accompanied by Florence, is sent to board with M.R.S. Pipchin, Dickens's number plan showing clearly that he was modeling this character on M.R.S. Roylance with whom he had lodged while his parents were in the Marshalsea, though memories of a seaside lodging housekeeper from an earlier period in the family's history seem also to have contributed to his depiction of his bride and ogress and child queller. Sending the number to Forster he wrote, I hope you will like M.R.S. Pipchin's establishment. It is from the life and I was there. I don't suppose I was eight years old. He was, in fact, all of twelve but had evidently already begun remembering himself as several years younger than he actually was at the time of the Warren's blacking episode, with the resulting intensification of the pathos of his forsaken condition as he recalled it to his mind. Point 14 Clearly, the process of consciously revisiting his past for literary purposes that had begun in the carol was continuing in Dombey. Dickens may even have Dombey and other dealings. 1846 to 1848 began working on an actual autobiography or memoir before he thought of using M.R.S. Roylance in the novel since he goes on to ask Forster. Shall I leave you my life in M.S.? When I die. There are some things in it that would touch you very much, and that might go on the same shelf with the first volume of Hallcroft's. This does not, of course, mean that he had actually begun writing such a work only that he had at least thought about doing so. His allusion to the first volume of the memoirs of the dramatist Thomas Holcroft, 1745-1809, strongly hints at his having suffered boyhood hardships comparable to Holcroft's when Holcroft's family's fortunes had suddenly changed for the worse. Rather oddly, Forster does not seem to have risen to the bait. Audiobook generated by, Read with the Ears.